uh, comes in all seminars. So we have a great program, I think, for the whole semester. It's all set up. You can look at it on the website and see what's coming. We just make a few announcements. Next week, we'll have the Fall Research Symposium, where students show their research uh, projects in the summer um, form in form of a poster over in the Harney Colony. You know, the food and drink from 46. Please show up. Please uh, take a look at what's been going on this summer in the sciences and math. Um, if you are a student and you'd like to get some credit for showing up to lots of these seminars, 10 out of 12, you can sign up for Bio 398, and you can do that whether you're a bio major or not. Um, there's still room. If you are interested in that option, talk to Betsy Kirkpatrick, who's organizing that this semester. You get a quarter activity unit for that. There's a little bit of a write-up component, but it's quick. Um, if you come in through there, you see that there's, there's a coffee and cookies. If you can relate, there won't be no cookies anymore. Um, there's also some mugs that are sustainable, more sustainable than what you have here. And uh, they're not that many. That's because every time that we bring some in from donations, they get stolen as fast as I can get them donated. So if you have any mugs in your um, kitchen and you would like to get rid of them, everybody has more mugs than they need, please bring some in. We'll add them to the donation. I will wash them afterwards, so you don't have to worry about that. And then they will be uh, returned back here the next week. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker for today. Um, sorry, that's my seat. Um, Leslie Cicido is going to talk to us about her research and uh, about what flies can be about about cancer. So let me tell you a little bit about Leslie. Leslie got her um, Bachelor of Science in Microbiology at the University of Illinois. And then she worked for a few years as a research assistant to see what it's like to actually be doing stuff outside the ivory tower. At least for a little bit she was also outside the ivory tower and then she did was in an ivory research tower, in another ivory, ivory tower, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, always nice to be in there. Uh, and then she decided that wasn't enough for her to do a PhD in uh, molecular and cell biology at the University of Wisconsin. And then after that she came to the West Coast and worked for a few years, three, three years, four years, at the Touch um, Cancer Research Center out in Seattle. And then she, from there she came to us. And here she is. Okay. Well, thanks for coming out today. And I'm really happy to have this opportunity to talk to you about uh, my research program and what we do here at UBS and answer this question about what fruit flies can teach us about cancer. Uh, at a superficial level, if you looked at a fruit fly in a human, you probably think what they can teach us about is flying, so that's why I have this image that I ripped off the internet like a decade ago and I can't find it again, so I can't cite it, but I'm unwilling to give it up. So um, it's not a revolutionary statement to say that uh, fruit flies are a very strong genetic model. Um, 1910, the first, in a laboratory setting, the first mutant was identified by Thomas Hunt and Morgan. And one of these flies is considered wild type, and one of them is considered mutant. So which one's the mutant? How many people think the top one, white eyes? And how many people think the bottom one? Okay, it is the top. So next time you see uh, flies um, hanging out in your kitchen, they should be like this. If they're not, they might be from my research lab. <laughs> Genetics yeah. <laughs> What's that? We set them yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so we've come a long way in the last hundred years. There are uh, more than one mutant available now. Um, well over 25, I mean, definitely well over 25,000 mutants available, but there is a resource center, um, well, a few across the um, globe, one in the U.S., um, located in Bloomington, Indiana, that stores stocks of fruit flies that have no mutations in them. Um, and the genome was sequenced back in 1999, and all the mutations um, are aligned to genes. Um, and here I'm just showing you a very small span of a Drosophila chromosome, um, and all the genes that are available are known to be on that chromosome, uh, indicated with the blue uh, arrows. And just picked a couple of those to show you the number of mutants that are available in those genes. So if you were interested in those genes, if they had something to do with whatever you're studying, um, you simply send uh, Depending if you buy five or less stocks, they're fifteen dollars a piece. When your six stock comes in, it's five dollars. But relatively cheap um, system to work with, and again, tons of mutations available. Okay. 
So flies are this great genetic model. What does that have to do with cancer? Well, cancer is the result of genetic mutations. And this slide captures that very well, um, many aspects of that. Um, sometimes when you think of uh, something being genetic, you tend to only think about inheriting genes from your parents. Um, most genetic contributions to cancer are not um, genes that you inherit, but mutations that you acquire during your lap lifetime. So you can start with a normal cell here at the top in yellow, um, have a few cigarettes uh, as a teenager, introduce a mutation into one of the daughter cells, that mutation is going to be copied and replicated into its daughter cells. Um, and over time, um, sometimes it's not always bad habits. Mutations happen um, on just eating. So, you know, got to do it, so it's not necessarily a bad habit. Um, are um, things that can induce mutations in cells. However, it takes several mutations to happen in one cell um, and, or its ancestors uh, before you actually get to a point where that cell is going to be affected, affected that contributing. So what's the highest risk for cancer? Uh, risk factor for cancer? Life. Life, yeah, age. And so that's represented really well here. The longer you live, the longer time you have to accumulate enough mutation in a single cell um, to contribute to cancer. If you do inherit one, uh, you're, you're in trouble because every one of your normal cells has a single mutation. So you might get to cancer a lot earlier. Leslie? Yeah. Does that also follow that if you were exposed to a, a carcinogen at a very young age, that that also is a big risk factor? Yeah. For sure. um, I've been out of the skin cancer field for a while, but in graduate school, that's what I focused on. And studies back then were saying there was actually the number of sunburns you got before age three that was the greatest predictor of skin cancer. So burn away. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, that data you know may have been just put by now, but but yeah, that early. Um, so we've got Drosophila genes, cancer genes, do they overlap well? And unfortunately there hasn't been a new study since 2000. Um, this was done after the fly genome was sequenced, um, but the entire human genome hadn't actually been sequenced when this paper was released. But at that time they looked at uh, human genetic diseases and looked into the fly genome to see how many of those genes had a, a version in flies, how many genes that contributed human disease had a version in flies. Um, and it was caused different types of diseases, and here I'm just highlighting cancer and uh, neurological diseases. But the number to, um, so for cancer it says 47 out of 65, that meant there were 65 genes at that time known to be involved in human cancer, and fruit flies had 47, uh, 47 of those genes. So well over two thirds, so showing not every gene that's gonna contribute to cancer will you find in flies, but um, more than a majority, so a good system. So these genes, although I think I probably just sort of misspoke there, uh, they're not there to cause cancer. It's only when they're mutated that they cause cancer. So genes that can contribute to cancer normally have healthy functions in your body. And it's because there are times when your cells should be growing and migrating, and there's times when they should not be doing that. And so um, the types of genes that can be mutated that contribute to cancer fall into two general categories called oncogenes and suppressors. <coughs> And this uh, simple slide is just highlighting what they normally should be doing. So, you know, when you go from being an embryo to a, a full-size adult, your oncogenes are very busy. They're creating many more cells. You're gaining mass. Um, as an adult, your tumor suppressors are probably a little bit more busy. We don't gain mass, and if we do, it's in our fat cells, and we're not actually usually creating more cells for that. Um, or I guess some people lift weights or something like that to that gain mass. But, um, they're there to normally say, now is not a good time to divide, um, chill out. So they have to be mutated to contribute to cancer. And they're mutated in two different fashions. Oncogenes are mutated so that they're on too much or they're um, being expressed at inappropriate times, in inappropriate places. And so um, they're telling cells to divide even more than they normally should. <laughs> and then the mutations that happen in tumor suppressors uh, tend to be more with people classically think about mutations, it inactivates their function. So a break that's normally there is no longer um, able to stop cells from dividing. And so one last thing highlighting fruit flies as a model for studying cancer biology is um, this 
lots of benefits besides the genetics. They have a short life um, span, so you can go through several generations very quickly. But also, um, their growth period is very, very short. So it, their growth period takes place between um, an embryo hatching into a larva uh, until it gets to a pupil stage, and that's just four days, and they grow 200-fold in size during that time. So that is um, when we need to manipulate genes to see how we can change um, how cells grow in size. And sometimes we wait for the adult to come out, and we look for a phenotype that resembles cancer. But a lot of times we don't wait for that. Um, so we'll actually go into the larva, um, which is represented here, and we'll pull out tissues that can become appendages um, in the adult flies. But they're really great tissues. They're called uh, imaginal discs. They're made out of epithelial cells. The vast majority of human cancers, well over 90%, are epithelial cells in nature. They're flat. We can actually count the cells. So they're very simple tissues that allow us to do a lot of quantification of what we mean by cell division and growth. And we tend to really basically focus on the <coughs> this here. It's the largest one, although it's still, you know, as big as the tip of a pin. We have to do these dissections under the microscope. So when we're looking at these tissues in the laboratory, this is an example of what we'd be looking at. So this is a wing disc. It would develop into an adult wing. Um, if we had not removed it gently from the organism, I guess it's will. Um, and here I'm showing, I'm, I'm skipping over how we do all the manipulations of the genetics because it's, it's only fun for maybe two or three people in the audience to listen to that. But I'm just showing you the end result of how we at least detect which cells we genetically manipulated and which we haven't. So all the cells in blue here are normal cells, and then the green cells are the ones that we've changed the genetics of. And we like this system where uh, we have a lot of normal cells around with some genetically mutated cells embedded there because that's how a cancer starts to rise. It's not like your entire tissue is cancerous all at once. And sometimes normal cells can do a lot to try to prevent cancer from um, progressing. Wow. Okay, so some very extreme examples of what cancer could look like in flies, and these um, were um, created on purpose by um, researchers. And even if you haven't had a lot of intimate um, relationships with fruit flies, I'm hoping you can see how extreme these are. So um, in this case, there's been a tumor uh, created in the head tissue. The head should be nice and flat there. Um, it looks like the brain's basically growing outside of the head. And this was a, a pretty hot study at the time where they were trying to argue that fruit flies uh, could be a, a decent model for metastasis. I'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. But in general, it's just a cell leaving its original site, a uh, tissue site, traveling through the body and landing somewhere else. And what these researchers did is they caused genetic mutations that happen only in eye tissue. Eye tissue is unique in fruit flies because it's the only tissue that has a red pigment. And the lighting and the projector aren't the greatest here, but I hope you can see there's a huge red mass in their abdomen. So they could actually visualize that those eye cells have left the eye uh, head capsule and moved into the head. Neither of these critters is actually alive, um, so um, if you ever found a mutation like this on your own, you'd be stuck because you could have made them and figure out what the gene was. So they do. They took genes that were already involved in cancer and saw what they could do in flies. So I'm really going to talk about uh, some pretty old work in the lab, but it's it came to like an endpoint basically. It was a very nice um, example of how fruit fly um, research could inform human biology, and then I'll spend most of the talk on uh, the ongoing research in the lab. Uh, this first um, finding that came out of my research involved finding a gene called Red that had never been implicated in cancer at all. Um, and I'm showing here just one image of a phenotype, or what it can do. I'll turn the lights back on so I don't fall asleep too quickly. And here, um, we're looking at actually the analogous tissue of a liver for a fruit fly. And this gene rep, we were able to show, acted like an oncogene. So basically, if it was on too much, it allowed the cells to grow in an uncontrolled manner. And this is a um, 
very specific sort of experiment, but here I've let the animals feed as they would want to. But here I starved them for three days. Um, and insects are very good at being starved and holding out for quite a while, but one reason that's true is because they slow down their metabolism. Um, and so all the normal cells, again, are blue, uh, either the fed animal or the starved animal. Normal cells will not continue to grow when the animal is starved. In fact, they start to look kind of crunchy. You'll see the nuclei don't look nice and round anymore. They're, I mean, they're angry, they're hungry. But the guys that are overexpressing red start to actually, they grow quite a bit and they get huge. And they actually, that actually ends up killing the organism when it would normally um, be able to sustain that um, star a starvation diet. And this is just a great example of what can happen in cancer cells as well. They basically take more nutrients than their, their fair share. <coughs> so, um, what I was able to show was that this gene rev actually fit into an existing pathway that was known but was incomplete both in humans and flies, and that's an insulin signaling pathway um, that most of you have probably at least heard about insulin. Um, its main role is to detect the amount of sugar in the blood and then um, uh, allow cells to release or uh, uptake um, sugar to, to sort of make you know, homeostasis of sugar in the blood. So it's a pretty complex pathway. All these uh, guys are different proteins. Um, I was able to show that REV fit right here in the pathway. And it actually serves as a nice moderator between sugar levels and this nutrient import. This is amino acids here to make sure you both have sugars and amino acids to build macromolecules. Um, but it, up to this point, it had been missing in this pathway. And what made that really exciting is its relationship here with this complex that's called TSC 1 and 2, and that stands for tuberous sclerosis 1 and 2, which is a mutation that leads to human cancers. So we were able to show what the relationship was. We knew it was negative, um, and then we looked at it from a biochemical <coughs> viewpoint. Uh, REV can be either active or inactive based on whether it's bound to a nucleotide called GTP when it's active, or the version of that nucleotide that's missing one of its phosphates, GDP. And we were able to show that it was this tuberous sclerosis one or two that moved it from the active state to the inactive state. And in human cancers, uh, which are called tuberous sclerosis, um, about 80% of those patients were shown to be lacking the, this gene. So tuberous sclerosis was a tumor suppressor that was no longer functioning in those cancers. But what that means is the TSC1 and 2 is actually not contributing to the cancer. It's no longer functional. So it was actually red being overactive that allow, allows those, um, or at least helps those cells to grow uh, when they should be growing. So again, this was sort of the perfect scenario of finding something for some fruit flies. It fit very nicely. Um, to a missing component of a human pathway and to a human cancer. So what the lab has been focusing on um, for the last several years is a different protein called PRL, um, which was actually found very, very fortuitously by us. Um, but what we've been showing in the lab over the past few years is this protein acts like a tumor suppressor. And this was a very big surprise because both of the way we found it, and also because of all the data that started to come out in the last six or seven years that um, has identified this family of proteins. There's three versions in human and just one in fruit flies. But in humans, it's um, being uh, detected as a biomarker to indicate whether uh, cancer has metastasized or not. So this was um, done mostly through clinical studies uh, with basically no interest in what PRL does, but to just uh, do high throughput screens to see, let's just use every antibody to every protein we know and see if we can find proteins that correlate with a, a certain step in cancer. So the first paper came out of colon cancer. They showed if your <coughs> primary tumor had high levels of PRL, the chance of metastasize was well over 90%. And then it's um, several uh, dozens of other cancers that have shown this relationship. So just uh, highlight what that means. Uh, you have a primary tumor um, where your tumor originally lo is localized. Um, usually that's pretty treatable. Um, it 
it's really metastasis that starts to lower your prognosis um, quite a bit. So metastasis means that your primary tumor has to enter the bloodstream, it has to survive the bloodstream, it has to exit the bloodstream, and wherever it lands, it has to be able to survive there too. So a lot of, again, we have a lot of protective medicine uh, mechanisms to keep that from happening, but in later stage cancer, um, it does. So when they looked at primary tumors and saw high levels of PRLs, they could um, very strongly predict whether you have metastases or not, or patients have metastases. But here we're seeing it act as a tumor suppressor, so that seemed very counterintuitive. So I'll just show you some of the data um, by why we call it a tumor suppressor. Um, it's a bit more subtle than others. So here we're overexpressing PRL in a fly wing. Um, uh, it's actually across the bottom half of the wing here, but it reduces the size of that wing by 10%. And this one being a lot more dramatic, we're expressing it throughout the entire organism. So here's a controlled larva um, at the end of its larvogenesis stage. And if we force expression in that animal PRL, it does not leave, it does not grow. It does, I mean, it grows a little bit, but it's about tenfold reduced in size. So that is very characteristic of a tumor suppressor preventing cells from dividing preventing them from growing mass. Um, that was in a normal setting, so they're fruit flies and we're changing the levels of PRL, but everything else is normal. All the stuff coming from the human field was mostly clinical biology, looking at samples of patients and looking at cancer cells, so very abnormal. So uh, for a while, we were thinking, well, maybe once we had abnormal conditions, we would see PRL act more to promote cancer, but in fact we're seeing the opposite still. So now we're in an intestine, um, again I'm just going to lay down briefly here, and we've introduced a genetic mutation in a known oncogene, and it causes uh, the stem cell population, the smaller blue cells compared to these large ones here, the large ones here, to start to grow out of control. But if we add PRL into the mix, we see it actually starts to counter this oncogene, so it's still acting like a tumor suppressor. So what we've been doing for the last couple years now is trying to figure out, well, why is this? Um, there has been one other report um, coming from the mammalian field uh, using normal cells that also um, suggests that, they, that PRL functions like a tumor suppressor under normal so our big question now is like, so what has to be different to allow PRL to start acting to promote cancer instead of inhibiting cancer? We have three general areas that we're pursuing uh, to answer this question. So the first area is we're still looking for other genetic alterations that might allow PRL to act differently. Um, again, the studies that say it can promote cancer are coming from cancerous conditions with lots of genetic mutations. Our second area is PRL has been reported to be in different places in a cell, and um, that could regulate its function. So it's been reported to be in the nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum, and the plasma membrane. And so depending on where it's localized, maybe it could perform a different function. Perhaps when it's in the nucleus, it would be a tumor suppressor, and if it's at the plasma membrane, it would be an oncogene. And finally, um, PRL is an enzyme, predicted to be an enzyme. The P stands for phosphatase. Um, and there's been some really nice biochemical studies that show um, it's, as an enzyme it needs to have an actocyte that can bind to substrates. But this actocyte can be open and closed based on um, oxidizing or re reducing conditions. Um, so again, that might be a way of switching PRL's activity from one uh, opposing activities from a tumor suppressor to a oncogene. So I'll just briefly show you um, what we've done um, in these three different approaches. Okay, so just to remind you, um, so metastasis tends to be a later event. Our first approach is what earlier events maybe need to happen, earlier genetic mutations need to happen in order to get parallel to act like an oncogene. So we picked a simple test to screen through hundreds of different lines of flies that had genetic mutations in them. And um, this is really hard to capture um, in a 2D uh, image. Under the microscope, I promise it's a little more apparent. You guys would agree with me? Yes? Yeah. 
But if we force expression of PRL to the top half of a fly wing, so a fly wing is two layers of cells, PRL uh, inhibits growth, and if we force that expression at the top layer, um, there's fewer cells on the top and the bottom, so the wing starts to curve up. And this is pretty easy to see under a light microscope. So we took that uh, original phenotype, and then, again, we crossed these flies with hundreds of different other types of flies that are actually missing big chunks of their genome. And we looked to see if we could either enhance that phenotype so the wing actually curves a lot more, or we should see that there, or suppress it where the wing lies completely flat. And we got through about two-thirds of the fly genome with this uh, assay. And at that point, we had enough to, to keep working with, so we, we stopped. But uh, I'm showing you here um, different regions of the fly genome, and um, I'm using older terminology. This is cytological positions uh, before the sequence, but they're shorter, so that's why they're there. But these numbers and letters simply refer to different segments of the fly genome. And we found if we crossed flies um, that were missing parts of the, those parts of their genome, we could see either a suppression or enhancement of the PRL phenotype. And we know where those segments begin and end. So in this last uh, uh, column, I'm showing you the number of genes that are in that segment. So you can see we have a lot of uh, candidates to pursue in our hands. But the next step is, whenever possible, to, lower, uh, to get a smaller segment to look at. Um, but we would want to test mutations in each one of those genes uh, to see if they're the gene responsible for uh, modulating PRL's function. And again, maybe those are the genes that would have to be mutated to allow PRL to contribute to cancer instead of actually inhibit. The second approach is to determine whether where PRL is in the cell, um, if that correlates to its function. When we started this assay, we didn't know where PRL was in our cells. So we first had to create an antibody um, and found out um, once we had the antibody that under most, most cases, and in the cases where we saw tumor suppressive function, it is at the plasma membrane. So here we have um, a little cartoon of uh, some important motifs and domains in PRL proteins, but it's this last one here that have been predicted to be necessary for it to get into a membrane. So it's only four amino acids here. Um, they are able to receive a long hydrophobic tail that means that hydrophobic tail is going to go hide in the plasma membrane and hold the protein there. So we went ahead and um, just using molecular biology and uh, immunogenesis uh, strategies created a new PRL that lacks those four amino acids, and so we call that PRL1 no cax. So the hope here is that PRL would no longer go to the membrane, maybe now it would go to the nucleus or somewhere else in the cell, and we would see it act like an oncogene. So we got a nice surprise here. Um, I guess I could have broken this up into different channels, but this is the wild type PRL. Um, it's being stained with red, the blue is DNA. And I'm hoping you can see here, um, where you can see blue and red at the same time, uh, the, the red is like a cobblestone around the blue, so it was pretty, this is the wild type and it's um, membrane localization. And then here we have the NOCAX PRL version, and it's still a cobblestone phenotype. So even though we got rid of the motif that was predicted to be responsible for getting into the membrane, it's still getting there. You'll have to trust me again based on the resolution of the, of the projectors on it, but it does look different anyhow. Can anyone see a difference out there? Besides the people in my lab? <laughs> so it definitely looks more discreet here, more tightly associated with the membrane, and uh, for very scientific term, more fuzzy here. So it feels, it seems like it maybe isn't as tightly associated with the membrane. And so one hypothesis we have is that wild type PRL truly is embedded in the membrane via a hydrocarbon tail, but maybe the no-cax PRL can get there because it's bound to a second protein, but that binding might allow it to kind of release, bind, release, bind, and not be as tightly associated with the membrane. So in a sense, we thought, okay, we failed. It still got to the membrane. We didn't get to ask our question about whether subcellular localization reflects function, but then we were totally surprised to find, even though it was getting to the membrane, it didn't function like a tumor suppressor anymore. So uh, 
it seems like just a different, subtle difference in how tightly it's associated with the membrane um, alters its function. So um, we're still scratching our heads a bit on this. Um, we may have, and, and thinking about how we're going to approach it next. Okay, and the final approach is to further pursue um, this idea that PRL could be um, switched on or off based on levels of oxygen. This is pretty um, provocative because it fits nicely with cancer in that a tumor can only grow a couple of millimeters until, unless it is able to draw a new blood supply to itself, and that's called angiogenesis. Um, and it will start to do that because it senses a, a reduced level of oxygen in it. So the way the regulation um, works from the biochemical journals is that if you have oxidizing conditions, your active site is closed. So we could say um, the oncogenic function is off as long as there's plenty of oxygen. If your tumor grows large enough, the oxygen levels uh, get reduced, the active site opens, and now it can function as an oncogen. Um, so uh, we have a scheme to create a mutant version of the protein again, um, this time that would prevent it from sensing oxygen, basically, and opening and closing response to that. Um, we've made the product a few times, we just haven't successfully cloned it to use to make the transgenic animals. So the overall goal of all of this, of really um, looking at cancers in all this great detail and figuring out molecules that let you know something about how the cancer is um, progressing, also has an added benefit of how you might treat those cancers, um, and that is maybe you could be a lot more specific when you try to kill cancer cells. So classical chemotherapy, uh, and yeah, well classical chemotherapy, we'll just stick with that, basically targeted any cell that was dividing at a, at a decent rate. And again, as adults, we're not, our cells aren't dividing as much as they were when we were growing, but we do have plenty of cells dividing, we're replenishing our tissues all the time, um, and so the big disadvantage to using that type of chemotherapy is that you kill a lot of healthy cells and most of the um, side effects of chemotherapy reflect that. You don't eat well, you don't want to eat because all of your epithelial cells in your intestines are dying and so on. So the new approach is that if we could find these molecular, specific molecular signatures to cancers that we could really just kill them. And so I wanted to think about that in terms of what we found in red, with RED and PRL so far, so I'm going to just work my way back here. Okay, so here in these patients that have tuberous, tuberous sclerosis um, are lacking TFC. It's overactive RED that is helping to contribute to their cancers, so what could we do with that information? What kind of specific chemotherapy could you Rep. You're not a chemist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so okay. you want to find something that can either detect red or maybe even inactivate it. So, um, again, this is pretty sweet because inactivation is all just about getting a phosphate off. So, perhaps you could um, come up with a chemical for that. Um, what about PRL? I guess we, don't, we can't put it in a pathway yet, but. What would you want to do in terms of chemotherapy with that? Maybe if you could find a way to get it to permanently stay in the membrane, because that's the only thing that really showed that it was causing or acting as well. You wouldn't want to turn it off because it usually does get Right, so I don't think there's a clear answer right now. Like, like you're indicating, if it can act like a tumor suppressor under some conditions, you probably don't want to be targeting it throughout the body. Um, you know, maybe if it's acting like the oncogene in the cancer, well, that's great, you might fight that cancer, but you might be helping other cells become cancerous by turning off one of their tumor suppressors. So, this is something we 
we feel that you know we're in a position to really inform human biology by following this line of investigation, figuring out really you probably want to know something else besides just PRL. Yeah. Um, so these uh, metastatic cells, they refer to certain tissues. Um, yeah. So there there are themes to wherever the primary tumor is, where it's best um, accepted by a different tissue, although. It's kind of tricky, sometimes it's just blood flow, so there's sort of that first pass tissue that it's going to see first and end up in. But there are themes as to where primary tumor, you're most likely to find the metastases in that. Yeah? Could you uh, like look at the kind of like similarities between GSC1 and the PRL and then kind of figure out what similarities might they share? Yeah, then, so they probably don't share many similarities at all. Sorry, that I should have warned you. Um, but that, that brings up a really good point. Um, or like some unique differences or I mean, something that would yeah. lead to kind of like an understanding of uh, like what PRL may function when it's kind of a, that hydrophobic component is mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so I mean the similarities that they have is they both seem to act like tumor suppressors. But one thing that makes cancer is so complex is that everybody's cancer is unique and even when you find some genes in common that are mutated between people, because it is a genetic disease, it always reflects <coughs> your genetic environment as well. I mean, that, I think, you know, the idea of a cure for cancer becomes very difficult that way because it's going to be pretty unique to at least groups of individuals. But, but no, I mean, there's still, like, there are similarities that might be sort of bottlenecks where you can capture lots of different because it seems like TS, uh, TSC1, when it's uh, not present, mm -hmm. cancer goes in, you know, it's produced. Right. And when uh, PRL is, the hydrophobic component is removed, mm -hmm. it seems like cancer is not prevented. So. Right. Yeah.
the glucose and amino acids and stuff like that. Say that so there's a so there are two or three biochemistry labs that are just working in test tubes. So they were able the only target they've been able to show that PRL actually removes phosphates from is estrogen, but they didn't look at it in the cell context of what the phenotype would be from that. Yeah, I was wondering if you could see the mutation, PRL mutation affects the localization Yeah, so but we have membrane protein, Yeah, we don't have an antibody for estrogen. We, I mean, we did look for genetic interactions with it. We didn't see any. Um, oh, I'm, let me take, so we don't have an antibody for Ezra, but we did, I think we do have a generic antibody that's supposed to recognize the shared motif between Ezra and Louise and all those guys. We didn't see any difference with that. But in our genetic interactions test also didn't show uh, an enhancement or suppression. Yeah. So there's this picture with the larva that was overexpressing forced expressing PRL1 and it was much smaller than the other one. Mm -hmm. So is there a knockout mutation for PRL1 that you can look at and compare with that much bigger than a, uh, than a normal larva? Uh, we have RNAi and um, I haven't looked at it super carefully. It did not kill them. Forced overexpression doesn't kill them and they didn't get delayed. So I kind of just I did the cross it also not in the right ratio. There was nothing dramatic about them coming out later. I'm just wondering if you Overexpress something. Sometimes you get the protein to do something right. that sticks around longer. It has a new function that it actually normally doesn't have. Right. So if you can complement that with a knockout, mm -hmm. where you show that the knockout then has a much larger phenotype, so the opposite of the normal. Right. That, that would maybe help you. Um, yeah, I know that would, that would be really helpful. Is it difficult to get those? Uh, I mean, we tried making an allele for a long time, and uh, we were using Pielman and popping it out and trying to get it to take the gene with it. And There isn't one in five days of animal. It's just, no, just RNAi. I mean, there, yeah. <coughs> nobody else is working with it in flies yet, so there's not, there's nobody producing a lot of reagents besides us. Have they shown, like, the similarity between the VEGF and, like, the PRL, like, with hypocrisy, like, if my alpha? Right, yeah, there's been no obvious relationship um, to think of. I don't think has any regulations that a phosphate, but, um, but I have to look more at that, but there haven't been any reports of that. Yeah? Um, you mentioned that... I mean, it doesn't have to be the phosphate anyway, but yeah. You mentioned that PRL has a short segment, the CAAX, uh -huh. that um, binds it to the membrane, um, and when that was removed, it didn't associate with the membrane as well, and no longer acted as a suppressor, mm -hmm. which suggested that um, the association to the membrane was important. But is it possible that maybe the CAAX had another function that was important to it um, suppressing? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, it's a pretty small, you know, part of a protein. Um, so probably not complex enough to have a very complex function. It's definitely well defined as being an acceptor for these hydrophobic tails. But one other thing that we see there, and again, it hasn't been reported by anybody else, so we're not really sure what to make of it, but when we force overexpression of that version of PRL that doesn't have those four amino acids, um, it gets remember it's still it's a little more fuzzy looking, but it also the levels are way lower than we <coughs> expect. So I go back to show you that slide, but I had to up um, the lasers quite a bit to get the same intensity compared to control. So we think, we don't know that it's actually necessarily that domain, but maybe if it has some freedom of binding the membrane and letting go and maybe binding again through another protein, I think it's probably getting targeted for degradation through ubiquitin or something like that. Um, so it'd be a little bit indirect, but it would say that strong association with the membrane is necessary to keep it from being destroyed. Have you thought of maybe sort of putting another cap in front of the CAX as opposed to just removing entirely to see if it would um, still work as a tumor suppressor, but not bind to the membrane. Um, yeah, I mean that's we now that we've taken away the hacks, we we don't know what sequence of PRL might be responsible for getting into the membrane. That was the only one that followed the rules of, of localizing proteins to the membrane. So that's we think it's probably just a second protein, but since that's membrane associated. So maybe like could hear or something that you'd always expect at the membrane, but. 
we don't know where we find, and that hasn't been reported by anybody else that they find each other at all. So also about the Cax um, motif and the idea that the protein is still binding to the mm -hmm. membrane, is it possible that there might be some post-translational modifications that are on the protein that you don't know about because oh. you know you just know that you're missing the cax the cax box in the end. Right. So maybe that is anchoring in the membrane rather than an interaction with another protein. For sure, yeah. It's definitely possible. I mean another observation I've made is so that was in the wing does and again we like working with those the best. But um, sometimes when I pull out wing discs I get some other discs and there's this other this, this, this halter, this little balancing <coughs> well, It seems like the protein's completely gone. So um, I'm kind of thinking one approach might be to look at different tissues and see when it's associated with the membrane still and maybe when it's not. And again, that it's completely gone and sort of deciding that's because it didn't associate the membrane and got degraded by ubiquitin. And sort of forcing it to be there and it's not there. Um, but maybe we could find tissues where no longer associated with the membrane. We could figure out, I mean, the problem is there's so many different proteins different between different tissues, but that would be one way to go about it too. Or doing more biochemistry like you know, precipitations and stuff like that, finding people up uh, for case in mind. And enough? What does RAS stand for? RAS homolog enriched in brain. What is the phenotype? Do you have a phenotype for that mutation? Uh, for a mutation, uh, they do not grow. And tuberous sclerosis is also primarily a brain tumor, so it, it worked out really well. It's in the right place. Yeah. Uh, have you uh, tried to see, like, I'm assuming that with the Reb, whenever it's uh, the TSCI is one, is uh, not active, uh -huh. or it's not functioning properly, that cancerous cells are produced, right? Is that correct? Well, they get to grow, they get to grow out of control. Yeah. Out of control. Yeah. And have you tried somehow to correlate between PRL and Reb in a sense that to see if the rate of growth is much? Yeah, I haven't played, or even, so maybe the most basic thing would be would PRL stop Reb and use growth? Yeah, um, because then if you can see, like, if it's, uh, if they're both kind of like changed and the rate's still the same, then there must be something else mm -hmm. involved in there. But if it's increased rate of growth, then it might be that they're both working together or opposing each other. Yeah, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I've been working um, with, so Reb is, is, it is very specific to this one type of cancer. So the, the genes that we've been sort of looking for interactions with are ones that are more general across different cancers. But that's a good idea. I mean, I have everything in the lab and I hadn't thought about just testing those. I, I kind of stay away from red because it did take off in the human field. I, I can't compete with, you know, type one research institutions that are doing human biology. So, I mean, yeah. I could compete. <laughs> Let's think. Less. I could. <laughs>